So um, I will be speaking today um, about the different layers of um, ambivalence and ambiguity around speciesism and about how the controversy that has surrounded the term speciesism um, and the idea that is expressed by that term affects our capacity to perceive the full range of manifestations of the phenomenon that is speciesism. And I will start by offering you a perspective on how the way definitions of speciesism have been introduced interacts with the substantive moral disagreement about which of our ways of interacting with non-human animals are justifiable and which aren't. And people have been um, ambivalent towards and in disagreement with each other about the justifiability of various practices that affect animals. And this disagreement or ambivalence has led some to reject accounts of speciesism that define it as morally objectionable. And this has resulted in a very unfortunate ambiguity in the term speciesism, as this term can either express a descriptive concept or a moralized or normative um, concept. And this ambiguity, of course, is not um, specific to speciesism. In fact, I will uh, in a minute give you a working account of speciesism in terms of discrimination and um, the very same ambiguity uh, attaches to discrimination, the ambiguity between normative and descriptive concept. However, for sp specific reasons, I believe it is more unfortunate and unhelpful in the case of speciesism. So I will first say something about the reasons for which the ambiguity between normative and descriptive uh, concept emerged in the case of speciesism in the first place. And then I will uh, only very briefly say something in defense of the normative or a moralized concept. And then I will go uh, get to why I think uh, this controversy about the content of the concept of speciesism amplifies tendencies to overlook certain kinds of manifestations of species, namely ones that are at least superficially positive or seemingly benign or benevolent. And I would suggest that as in other types of discrimination and prejudice, we should expect the phenomenon uh, that is speciesism to be um, similarly uh, varied, expressed not just in openly hostile ways, but in locally positive ways, and that these seemingly positive expressions um, likewise deserve our attention and um, more suspicion as well. So, um, sorry, that was one too quick. Okay, so uh, the ambivalence towards the charge of speciesism and the ambiguity of speciesism. I will um, rely on a working account of speciesism um, uh, and define it as, in terms of what I think amounts to discrimination, that is unjustified disadvantages treatment. So I think of speciesism as the unjustified, comparatively worse consideration or treatment of those who are not classified as belonging to a species or group of species whose members are favored or who are classified as belonging to a certain species or group of species whose members are disregarded. And throughout the talk, I will often speak of speciesism as concerning the disadvantageous treatment of non-human animals by humans. But this is um, simply because this is the most debated and most criticized, most important version of speciesism. And it's sometimes convenient to be able to use this type of speciesism as a placeholder. But I don't mean to imply by that that speciesism cannot um, concern differential treatment along other groupings of species as well. So in saying that um, this definition amounts to identifying speciesism with a kind of discrimination, I'm also relying on a notion of discrimination that is likewise moralized. So according to which discrimination is a kind of differential treatment or consideration that is also necessarily morally unjustified. And um, Depending on this moralized notion is not necessary for my purposes. You might um, also say alternatively that speciesism is wrongful, wrongful discrimination. However, I uh, presuppose the normative concept here. 
Um, so in the abstract to um, this talk, I said that definitions such as this one have been difficult to accept for some who have defended views that were thought to be suspicious of being speciesist. For instance, um, Carl Cohen defended animal experimentation with an emphatic rejection of this moralized concept. So he declared, I am a speciesist in a kind of emphatic and proud way. And I think this declaration might even be read as evidence of a positively charged rather than a neutral concept of species him. So here species him is held in such high regard that you might say um, that the positive evaluation of it becomes part of the very concept of um, species. Him. But in between these two uh, differently normatively charged uh, concepts, many have either criticized or often defended certain ways of differentiating between humans and animal, uh, non-human animals with respect to moral considerability and have relied therein on a concept of speciesism that is neither that neither includes an appraisal uh, of whatever falls under speciesism nor a moral indictment. So they have operated with a concept that drops the definition, the condition that speciesism is morally unjustified or bad or wrong and just refer to speciesism as a view, a position, a way of treating individuals. And of course, this mm, conceptual choice is understandable because otherwise the attempt to defend speciesism as such would have, would appear to be thoroughly misguided. Um, so these uh, authors have given different kinds of reasons for why the moral prioritization of humans though suspicious of being speciesist in the normative sense of the term is justifiable. And um, in this talk, I will not go into any detail about these justifications. Instead, I want to point out that for many of those who have advanced these justifications, namely those who, are, uh, who would acknowledge that there are also ways of interacting with non-human animals that are not covered by that justification, whatever justification they offer. For those, it is a bit odd that they not just make these arguments about specific ways of treating non-human animals, but to redefine the very concept of speciesism so that it will still be applicable to the practices or types of acts for which a justification is being, giving, being given. And this is independent of whether uh, the matter at hand is a justification of a specific practice or whether it's about showing that a certain value of feature such as species solidarity or loyalty can always serve as a ground for justification. Um, it's an at least remarkable strategy to combine the efforts for providing these kinds of arguments uh, with a conceptual alteration that ensures that the term speciesism will still be applicable uh, to whatever is shown to be justified or a possible ground for justification. It's remarkable because, well, for, for other reasons as well, but for one thing, because of the fact that in the original proposals for the moralized concept of speciesism, the intention was to establish or um, maybe rather uncover an analogy to racism and sexism. And with regard to these cases, there are fewer people who have the ambition to show that the terms racism or sexism apply after all to practices or positions they deem justified. Um, there, in these cases, the dialectical context or situation is different. People usually do not aspire to show that a case of sexism is justified sexism and that therefore sexism at large is justifiable, but rather that, but rather they want to show that something is wrongly suspected of being sexist. So it's peculiar that this reconceptualization happens in the case of speciesism. So um, having said that, I now want to show you why it's actually a quite reasonable response to the way the concept of speciesism was originally introduced. Um, again, as I just indicated, you would expect the moral debate to be about whether some practice or some supposed ground for justification of a general moral differentiation between humans and non-human animals would be the topic and then 
the disagreement would be about whether a justification goes through or whether the reasoning behind it or its outcome could justly be accused of being speciousist. But this substantive moral debate has been complicated by a layer of conceptual disagreement and the compl complicating factors here seem to stem from how the introduction of the concept of speciesism is embedded in a normative theory or a more moral commitment, which is Peter Singer's commitment to the principle of the equal consideration of interests. So Singer is the one who introduced the concept to a wider audience and he defines speciesism as follows. A prejudice, uh, species is a prejudice or attitude of bias in favor of the interests of members of one's own species and against those of members of other species. And this definition itself, I would claim, does not make any substantive moral assumption. It just speaks of speciesism as an attitude um, of bias against some individual's interests. It does not speak of a particular type of reasoning or view that would constitute or express such a bias. What this definition does, however, is locate the bias in question in the realm of moral reasoning by speaking of a bias against interest and not of a bias more generally, because by that it connects it to what we know from the context here um, to be a morally relevant item, individuals' interests. And in the even wider context in which this definition of species is given, a prejudice or bias against interest is something that necessarily violates moral principles, or at least rather the fundamental principle of equal consideration of interests. And then from Singer's other substantive moral arguments that um, uh, the differences that are typically advanced or are likely to be advanced in defense of an unequal counting and weighing of non-human animals and humans' interests, we know that it takes species membership itself to be morally irrelevant and morally irrelevant in a comparably obvious matter a manner as uh, race or sex. And we also know that other features supposedly correlated with species membership are disqualified as grounds for unequal consideration as well. And I think that this way of embedding the concept in a normative theory is one complicating factor in the debate. Um, and I will say more about this in just a moment. I just want to mention one further complicating factor that I can't get into within this talk really too much, but something that is another layer of conceptual complication here, um, which is that both uh, Singer and Richard Ryder, who actually coined the term, have clarified that speciesism in the strictest or even only viable sense refers only to behaviors and views that treat species membership in itself as morally relevant. Um, so Singer says the term speciesism refers to the view that species membership is in itself a reason for giving more weight to the interests of one being than to those of another. And Ryder speaks of this kind of view as strict speciesism, speciesism in the in its core sense or, st or strictest sense. And um, this is another um, conceptual um, decision that is that makes the resulting concept different from a concept that it was originally supposed to be analogous to. So these are two factors that complicate matters here. One is the um, embedding um, of the moralized concept of speciesism in a substantive moral theory. You could say the moral enrichment of the moralized or normative concept, the further moral enrichment. And the other is this restriction of speciesism to the attribution of moral relevance to species membership itself. So rather than some other property that then is just only correlated with species membership. And in this talk, I will only address this first factor. So maybe, I don't know, maybe during the discussion, we can come back to the second because it's um, the controversy over this narrow or this wider, wider account of species interacts with the disagreement over normative and descriptive concepts in interesting ways, I think. But I will focus again on the on the former um, complicating factor here, um, the moral enrichment um, of the theory. Um, so what happens 
uh, with this moral enrichment is that disagreement with the requirement of equal consideration of interests, the equal counting and weighing of humans and non-humans interests becomes a reason not just to object to the principle, but to reject the very concept of speciesism in its moralized way. So it becomes such a reason, at least to the extent that this normative principle is interpreted as a specification of what is meant by bias against interests in the definition of speciesism. And then any case in which the unequal consideration of non-humans and non-humans' uh, interests would seem to someone as justifiable would qualify as a counterexample to the very definition of speciesism. So for instance, here Bonnie Steinbock uh, takes issue with uh, Singer's agenda, introducing the concept of speciesism, saying that he has a kind of a hidden agenda, maybe. Singer's real aim, she says, is to bring us to a new understanding of the idea of equality, um, because he thinks that the principle of equality requires that no matter what the nature of the being, its suffering be counted, uh, is to be counted equally with the like suffering of another. And it's this view that she takes issue with, this moral view. It's not on the surface, the, the concept itself, but it's, it's the moral view that seems to be woven into the concept because then she ends up saying that, um, on her view, it's certainly not wrong for, of us to extend special care to members of our own species, motivated by feelings of sympathy, of sympathy and so on. And then she closes by saying, if this is speciesism, it is stripped of its tone of moral uh, condemnation. And though this is couched in careful conditional terms, it actually amounts to an abandonment of the normative concept of speciesism on moral grounds that relate to the theory to which it is connected and not the concept, I would say, as it could be defined um, itself, the, the moral normative concept, not the, um, the idea that there is this concept that has a tone of moral condemnation, but how it is connected to a specific moral view that leads to rejecting the concept. Um, so, and this is, of course, more or less outright opposition to Singer, but in fact, outright disagreement or opposition to the normative commitment involved in his account is not even necessary. Um, uncertainty or ambivalence towards the idea that humans and uh, non-human animals' interests must always be weighed equally would suffice if the principle is treated as an addendum to the definition, the principle of equal consideration of interests. And if one is ambivalent towards its validity, one has a reason to reject the proposed account of speciesism. And some critics of the um, normative concept voice just such an ambivalence or uncertainty, uh, even though maybe it's not always uh, an accurate uh, reconstruction of an author's stance or rep representation of an author's stance might just be a display of modesty. But for instance, uh, Shelley Kagan here says that first he was, when he first read these claims, he was almost, uh, almost 40 years ago, he was immediately um, convinced or found them persuasive. And then um, this per persuasion uh, lasted for a decades. It seemed clear to me, he says, as it seemed clear to Singer that most of us are speciesists and that speciesism was unjustifiable. But now I have to say the issue no longer seems to me nearly so transparent. It's not clear to me any longer that speciesism is indeed a mere prejudice. And again, speciesism comes into view here as a possibly justifiable stance, a certain view based on an uncertainty about the moral theory that surrounds its introduction to the debate. And again, the normative notion is effectively abandoned on moral grounds, I would say. So, and I will just very um, briefly indicate why I think this is so unfortunate. Um, the fact of persisting disagreement about the justifiability of certain practices that affect animals, uh, affect them negatively, 
in my view, should not be a reason to reject the normative concept of speciesism. And this is so for at least three reasons. The first one is that we simply do not need a descriptive term speciesism in order to be able to discuss questions of justifiability. So many cases are aptly um, subsumed under uh, anthropocentrism, many of the cases that are uh, under debate when it comes to speciesism. And if you uh, are really concerned about um, species, uh, about not just speciesism or species centrism, as I uh, suggest uh, an alternative term, as it concerns humans, but more generally, you can uh, use just this uh, other concept. So I propose species centrism, but there have been there other concepts have been proposed or other terms have been proposed to um, single out this, this view that would be um, a more general uh, concept, uh, kind of ranging above anthropocentrism and are subsuming under it anthropocentrism. And, there is simply no need to um, rip uh, speciesism of its normative content. Secondly, the moral enrichment of the concept through its um, association with Singer's moral theory is just um, an artifact, um, as is, I think, the restriction to the narrow version that I mentioned earlier. We can characterize speciesism in ways that omit substantive um, moral commitments to moral theories. Um, so for instance, as in the working account that I showed you earlier. And importantly, I think um, that most everyone in the debate has reason to value the function that a moralized or normative concept of uh, speciesism fulfills. Um, because so what happens when we opt for the for the descriptive concept? When we opt for that concept instead of the normative concept, we forego a means of issuing a normative judgment. When we speculate on the justifiability of um, speciesism as such, our moral vocabulary loses some normative expressiveness, I would say. And when it's Given the purely descriptive reading, speciesism is just not, no longer available, uh, available as an expression for what is conceptualized as unjustified, as an unjustified moral view or morally wrong behavior. And I think this loss is a loss for most participants in the debate. The ones who are not affected by this are the ones who believe that there simply is no level of disadvantages consideration that could be unjustified when it comes to members of certain species. So that members of other species cannot possibly be treated unfairly or wronged. And those who hold these views really have no use for a term denoting a bias against others' interests or a kind of discrimination against members of other species. But all others, so those who defend the preferential treatment of uh, one's fellow species members or, me or of members of a specific species and their critics alike, I think that they do incur a loss by giving up the normative term and therefore have at the very least a portanto reason to hold on to the normative notion. And usually I think this should translate into an all things considered reason for them. Um, not only do their views render the application conditions of speciesism uh, the normative concept in principle justifiable, but most of them should also be able to agree that these conditions are actually frequently um, satisfied. So for instance, uh, Bonnie Steinberg, whom I've quoted earlier, it, within her defense of speciesism says, we all agree that cruelty is wrong, uh, whether perpetrated on, moral, on a moral or non-moral agent, a rational or a non-rational agent, Cruelty is defined as the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering. So even with a comparably, comparably restricted view of what cruelty is in the first place, there is some line to be drawn according to this position between the justifiable and the unjustifiable. And there's actually much room for agreement here that what is beyond the line of the justifiable should be addressed as instances of speciesism. 
and others who have taken themselves to be defending speciesism um, draw this line even more narrowly. So for instance, Chapel says a wanton, playful routine or casual killing is always wrong. That rules out blood sports. And then it goes on. What else is ruled out by um, other types of wrongness of, uh, of types of acts? Um, meat eating is ruled out and apparently even um, animal experimentation is ruled out within a defense of speciesism. So um, again, it would be useful if what is deemed unjustifiable here could be addressed as species is because these are um, rampant phenomena which are deemed morally objectionable here and it would be useful to be able to call them speciesism or manifestations of speciesism. So I do not think that we need to settle all the cases in which there is still disagreement about justifiability in order to agree that the normative concept of speciesism has significant range of applicability and fulfills an important function in moral discourse, just as it is not necessary that we first um, reach a consensus about the moral evaluation of all individual suspected cases of sexism or racism for us to agree that classifications of practices as sexist or racist do involve a moral indictment. And the remaining disagreement in these cases can be settled by debating whether something is racist or uh, justified or just, and not by um, identifying it as racist and then asking whether it is really morally impeccable. So the problem with relying on a descriptive concept of speciesism is that it takes this notion off the table as a means of articulating moral objections. But this seems to me precisely what the merit of the concept is and what we should expect from it. So um, in this uh, second part of the talk, I would like to make the case that this disagreement about the scope and the normative content of the concept of speciesism has um, contributed to a um, preoccupation with certain kinds of um, expressions of speciesism and a neglect of other expressions of speciesism. That is, it has contributed to um, underappreciating the actual ambivalence uh, that attaches to the phenomenon that is speciesism. Um, what the argument about the merits of normative, of the normative account uh, of speciesism does, in my view, is to affirm what was originally, maybe simply, or not just asserted, but an argued analogy to racism and sexism. And by agreeing that speciesism is best seen as a kind of discrimination, or at least as morally objectionable, we recognize it as something that is basically structurally the kind of phenomenon that these other types of discriminations are. And these other phenomena are more multifaceted than, we uh, than I think we typically recognize speciesism to be. Um, at this point, there's one further uh, complication here in that defining speciesism in terms of discrimination may after all not be the end of it, namely in case that um, notions like prejudice, stereotypes, oppression, which are complementary approaches to characterizing the phenomena of, of um, sexism and racism, are not um, neatly analyzable in terms of discrimination. So if that is the case, then the concept might need to be complemented by additions to the definition that cover these other manifestations of speciesism or what we should expect to be other manifestations of speciesism if this analogy holds. Um, discrimination might just be one uh, lens to uh, through which we can look at speciesism or maybe just the, the nucleus of a definition of speciesism. So the main point um, is that there is a rationale for agreeing that speciesism is basically such a kind of morally objectionable phenomenon. And then I take this to be the basic agreement to gain from the debate about normative or descriptive concept. And in, the last, in this last part of um, the talk, I will 
talk about speciesism more in terms of prejudice or stereotypes based on this fundament fundamental classification of speciesism as something that is, after all, like racism and sexism and other phenomena of this kind. Because for these other kinds of morally objectionable phenomena, such as racism or sexism, it's been recognized that in their uh, manifestations as prejudice or stereotypes, there is more than just uh, what you might describe as the cognitive equivalence to disadvantages treatment. Racism and um, sexism are not seen as manifesting exclusively in negative or hostile beliefs, attitudes um, or stereotypes, but as including positive or benevolent ones as well. So sexism, for instance, um, has been described as including hostile and benevolent attitudes. And benevolent uh, sexism has been um, characterized as a set of interrelated attitudes toward women that are still sexist in terms of viewing women stereotypically and in restricted roles, but that are subjectively positive in feeling tone for the perceiver and also tend to elicit behaviors typically categorized as pro-social helping behaviors and intimacy seeking. Um, so the resulting overall ambivalent sexist picture of women shows them to be nice, benevolent, but incompetent, hostile. And um, benevolent sexism is thought to be a compensatory or legitimizing counterpart to hostile sexism. Both appear to be um, complementary and have been shown to predict gender inequality across cultures. And it's assumed that a prevalent tendency to agree with certain benevolent sexist statements, such as um, women, have a superior, women have a superior moral sensibility, or women have a quality of purity, or um, that these kinds of, uh, that the tendency to agree with these kinds of statements helps to pacify women's resistance to social gender inequality. These are quotes from the Click and Fiscal papers uh, cited on the slide. Um, so likewise, um, oh, I think that was wonderful. No, one's missing. So likewise, positive stereotypes appear to be crucial elements of racism. Um, Commendatory stereotypes such as the one linking African Americans to athletic excellence have been found to enhance the perception of differences. No, it's the right one, sorry. Um, uh, enhance the perception of differences between groups as grounded in fundamental natural distinctness, and they also facilitate uh, the application of negative stereotypes. Um, so it's been hypothesized that um, there are two mutually exclusive central traits along which um, uh, ambivalent uh, prejudice expresses itself or evaluates uh, persons. So um, groups or people with certain characteristics are um, perceived either as warm or, or competent, but not both. Um, positive stereotypes um, are um, hypothesized to or have been described as emerging when the social status of a, of a stereotype group is um, elevated and um, they are thought to be a compensation for the omission of negativity that um, goes with that change of um, socioeconomical status or just um, the uh, the a change in, in societal attitudes that uh, make um, the open expression of negative stereotypes um, to be perceived more as more problematic. Um, exposure to positive stereotypes can be a negative uh, interpersonal experience because it um, is perceived as, a, as the individualizing uh, individuals um, and internalized positive stereotypes can cause distress in those who have internalized these positive stereotypes. So for instance, the stereotype of uh, Asian Americans as a, a model minority can induce um, 
distress because it puts people under pressure to live up so to some uh, to certain specific uh, stereotypes that uh, constitute this overall this this larger more general stereotype um, and when people are reminded of positive stereotypes that apply to them that can impair their performance in the uh, realm of action that is positively stereotyped and also in a realm of action that is ne negatively stereotyped so it can um, put people under pressure or it can activate it can trigger awareness of a negative um, stereotype for for another domain of action um, ben uh, benevolent sexism has been linked to um, victim blaming when uh, women become uh, victims of violence and overall um, uh, job, I hope I pronounced that correctly, at all have found that mixed, uh, that positive stereotypes have mixed intrapersonal effects. So there are positive effects as well. Um, exposure to a positive stereotype can also um, increase performance, uh, uh, can serve as a motivator or a kind of encouragement. But um, for the interpersonal and intergroup level, uh, effects seem to be overall negative. Um, so prejudice and stereotypes appear to be ambivalent in many cases, and I think we should, in principle, expect speciesism to exhibit similar patterns. And one reason this is not often addressed, I think, is, is this preoccupation with questions of justifiability regarding what we, what some of us might uh, want to classify as hostile manifestations of speciesism. And that this preoccupation is made worse by the blending of conceptual and moral issues because of the way these different issues have been run together. The focus when it comes to speciesism has squarely been on questions of uh, the moral wrongness of certain um, ways of treating uh, non-human animals disadvantageously. Um, and uh, what everyone in the debate has acknowledged as disadvantages treatment and the question of their justifiability. Um, so insofar as um, the benign, the possible benevolent or benign manifestations of speciesism do not receive much attention, there, is, of course, there are of course further reasons for that. And I think the most important one is certainly that Hostile manifestations just have a special moral significance. They are rampant and they draw our moral attention for good reasons. And uh, we are justified in prioritizing them, I, I would argue. Um, also, uh, another reason might be the very nature of benign expressions of prejudice, which um, just feel uh, benign to the one who is prejudiced, to bystanders, and sometimes to those who are objects of prejudice. So these can be factors in maintaining ignorance about um, the fact that we are prejudiced at all. Um, and all this leads to maintaining a focus on just one of the possible dimensions of speciesism even where positive expressions might contribute in their own ways to detrimental effects for animals. So for instance, um, if we look at the controversy over interventions on behalf of animals in nature, um, then uh, we have, for instance, this um, reconstruction of the supposed problem with the resistance to such interventions that Oscar Horta gives, and he focuses on negative speciesist attitude. So um, he says the criticisms of the idea that we should help wild animals express concerns that are not really taken seriously when human beings are involved. So when human uh, humans need assistance, we don't um, uh, occupy ourselves with the supposed reasons that we advance to, uh, to reject the idea that we should help animals. And he says this shows a clear speciesist prejudice. And he goes on to say that a proposal such as the one I'm making here, so that we should intervene uh, on behalf of animals, may be questioned because the well-being of non-human animals is seen as completely irrelevant. And this is why such criticisms can only be held if we assume speciesist positions. So Horta mentions another 
um, focuses here, I think, clearly on, on negative expressions of speciesism, but he mentions one other dimension of uh, the evaluation of the proposal that he's making the proposal to intervene. Um, he says, there are many who believe that nature is a rich source of value because of the existence of non-human sentient animals who have happy lives. Mm, but he does not address this as an expression of speciesism. However, I think that one closely related contributing factor might be a tendency to represent animals as capable, well-equipped for their lives in their respective ecological niches. And this seems to be at least um, one possible, at least one possible candidate in some forms or in some instances for a benevolent ma uh, manifestation of species prejudice, the stereotype of the animal, of the wild animal as being capable and well-equipped and uh, fit for their, for the uh, circumstances which they face. Um, and then there is uh, another candidate, maybe there is this human enthusiasm for cute features, especially in domesticated animals. Um, and this is actually at uh, a point of um, uh, a, uh, something that um, there's a controversy about how uh, much potential for harm this enthusiasm for cute features really has, I think. Uh, which is uh, between um, Donaldson and Kimlicka, who propose a uh, political theory of animal rights and um, what they label abolitionists, but I think could be um, distinguished from their position, which I think is abolitionist in, uh, in one sense of the term as well, by saying, uh, by naming it extinctionist view. So in the Opolis, Donaldson and Kimlicka criticize abolitionists or extinctionists, the, those are those who seek to end species domination by ending relations with domesticated animals, arguing for their moral, for the moral desirability of their extinction. They criticize them for taking issue with the neotenous uh, features domestication has produced in companion animals. So they criticize the tendency to view juvenile features as signs of an unnatural or undignified existence for uh, domesticated animals. And even if you agree that maybe appeals to naturalness or digni uh, dignity are not as helpful, I think there is one way in which we could say that extinctionists, abolitionists might be seen as being on the right track when they point to these features and um, as an expression of a, of a problem. Um, because uh, we might say that these features could play a role in maintaining the benevolent complements of hostile speciesism by presenting animals as, and this would be the ambivalent prejudice, cute but dumb. dumb. So um, with cute being the benevolent part and dumb the hostile one. Um, However, there's one problem here that is that cuteness itself is not actually a prejudice or a precondition, but it's just a match between um, the physiological uh, features and an aesthetic preference. Um, yeah, but maybe to the extent that the quality of perceived cuteness is met with a preconception of some animals being inher inherently lovable or more lovable, Maybe in that way it relates to an attitude that might be seen as a benevolent expression of speciesism. There's maybe one more straightforward candidate for benevolent speciesism, uh, and this might be the tendency to ascribe quasi supernatural sensibilities to animals. So, uh, an ability to foresee natural disasters, having a sixth sense in, in this uh, with respect to that. So um, this mystification of or 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 at um, animal sense of orientation or of specific uh, sensory abilities looks like a species as counterpart to um, what has been described as a sexist tendency to ascribe, for instance, to women a superior moral sensibility. So this layer of idealization that can be placed on some animal's capacity, I would suggest, is a candidate for a benevolent expression of speciesism. 
And of course, this goes hand in hand with denying animals certain other cognitive capacities, and typically those that are also taken to be morally and politically relevant. So this goes hand in hand with hostile speciesism. So, um, and therefore might not this attribution of these more miraculous, but morally and politically irrelevant capacities be a uh, compensatory or legitimizing counterpart. This is the description that I take from the from the characterization of benevolent sexism. So it might be a, such a legitimizing counterpart to hostile speciesism. And in the case of speciesism, it would not serve to appease animals necessarily, but humans themselves, who often hold animals in some regard while maintaining belief in moral species hierarchies. Um, then there are also some more specific species specific uh, benevolent speciesisms. So uh, for instance, the uh, stereotype of the independent cat and the loyal dog. Um, and here we can uh, easily see that benevolent speciesism can come with some local benefits. So for cats, for instance, access to the outdoors and for dogs, it would be uh, being viewed as a valuable family member. But we are interested in benevolent expressions of any prejudice to the extent that they are part of an overall belief system or an overall um, practice that involves disadvantage on the global level. So they may be local benefits, but the idea that they are they occur within a, um, a system of global disadvantage is, I think, a constraint on the idea of benevolent prejudice. So the stereotype of animals being endowed with wondrous sensitivities did not have a connection to a disadvantage at which uh, they, are, they are placed globally. We might not be interested in this kind of prejudice or might not even subsume it under speciesism. So I think this is a this is the constraint of global disadvantage, even if local benefits um, are possible. However, in some cases, uh, benevolent manifestations of speciesism can have directly negative local effects. For instance, um, the withdrawal of care for cats who are being viewed as independent or humans not feeling responsible for these animals, um, or when the positive evaluation of the loyal dog switches completely uh, in the instance when the dog is seemingly not conforming to the stereotype. So when there is a biting incident, this can have very catastrophic effects for the dog. Um, and I think it might be the case that um, speciesism presents some different patterns of ambivalence in at least two respects. So one potential difference I think is to other types of ambivalent prejudice that uh, speciesism might be um, even the seemingly benevolent attributions of some capacities to animals might be more often directly self-serving uh, to humans than in cases of intrahuman uh, uh, prejudice. So when we attribute to animals capability, being capable of mastering their lives, having a sixth sense, um, being independent, then um, this seems to imply, suggest that we need not care for them, need not protect them from harm, we can let them fend for themselves and save themselves. And this close connection to negative effects might raise doubts about the classification of these expressions of speciesism as benevolent. They might seem as just um, hostile speciesism in disguise. But I think this um, structure is, is applies to other benevolent prejudices as well, to the extent that they are really um, legitimizing counterparts to genuinely hostile prejudice. Nevertheless, on the surface, these forms of prejudice, thinking of uh, animals as capable, independent, and so on, are benevolent or benign. Uh, but it could just be that they might be more often self-serving um, and that would be consistent with animals overall low social status that um, the benevolent expressions of speciesism um, 
do not have to be as um, positive even in in their immediate effects as in other case in other cases of social prejudice. And one further uh, difference um, might be so non-human animals might have less opportunity to profit personally and locally from uh, benevolent prejudice because it would be harder, for instance, to affect a performance increase by exposing them to positive uh, stereotypes. You cannot motivate them by telling them that they have superior capacities, or at least in many cases, I, I'm, I have no uh, immediate idea how that would work. So it seems that they can typically only profit from adjustment in human behavior to positive preconceptions. And these might be two or uh, more or less uh, crucial differences one of which likely has to do with the extent to the uh, of the global disadvantage that speciesism involves for animals. However, um, benevolent expressions of speciesism, I think, are morally and politically relevant manifestations that are more easily overlooked as long as ambivalence towards the justifiability of some hostile manifestations lets us accept a non-moralized concept of speciesism. Once we can agree that speciesism denotes something that is morally objectionable at its core, we can then more fully address what this morally objectionable phenomenon is and acknowledge that speciesism is uh, probably just as much a multi-layered phenomenon that uh, probably includes negative and uh, positive benevolent expressions as other types of discrimination. And these benevolent expressions might be morally objectionable in themselves for um, one of at least two reasons. So for instance, for one thing, they might be the effects of the unequal consideration of facts about individuals. So they might be results of discrimination on, a, on another level. And uh, secondly, they might be objectionable just because of their contributions to hostile uh, speciesism. So again, of course, hostile manifestations are certainly um, massive and require all more attention and our collective effort to overcome them, but to better understand what sustains them, we should probably also, at least in some cases, look out for their positive counterparts and um, yeah, then address speciesism in its actual ambivalence. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>